The construction industry is one of the world's biggest polluters. Join us as we explore creative solutions it's coming up with to save energy and lower carbon emissions on this episode of Sustainable Energy. Hello, I'm Asha Sampert, recording this episode from my neighbourhood in eastern France. Like others, our show has been impacted by travel and filming restrictions linked to the spread of COVID-19. I could not go to London this time. It's the location we picked to discuss sustainable building and to meet our main guest, Christina Gamboa, of the World Green Building Council. With 9.3 million people, Greater London is Europe's third most populous city and authorities there have pledged to make the UK capital carbon neutral by 2030. But that could be a little too ambitious. The city has many historic buildings, but a lot of them are not sustainable. According to the Association for the Conservation of Energy, nearly 3 million homes need to be retrofitted to help reduce CO2 emissions. But that won't be easy, as a lot of homes there have solid walls making insulating them difficult and expensive. And it's not just London. Retrofitting is a problem facing historic cities around the globe. So let's find out what foundations, architects and policymakers are laying for our buildings to be carbon neutral. Coming up on this episode, we'll dig deep to find out why it's so important to get the construction industry to be greener. Then we take you to Bali, Indonesia, where locals are betting big on bamboo. We are using this material, so we are reducing other material that may be like uh, need to produce with high energy. And we ask, would you live in a wooden skyscraper? We meet Michael Green, a Canadian architect who thinks wood is the future a sustainable building. Building codes are changing to allow us to build really tall wood buildings. That's a big game changer. More people means more buildings, but the way we build is under greater scrutiny than ever before. A report from the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, the International Energy Agency and UN say decarbonizing buildings and the construction industry is critical to achieve commitments laid out by the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So what will tomorrow's buildings look like? James, our roving reporter in London, will be discussing just that with Christina Gamboa, CEO of the World Green Building Council. But first, let's get our facts straight as to why the construction industry needs to change. Building sustainably may no longer be an option, rather a necessity. That's because today buildings and the construction sector are responsible for nearly 40% of global final energy use and process-related CO2 emissions. In other words, it takes a lot of energy to heat, cool, light and maintain our buildings. And the process to build them in the first place is traditionally energy intensive. Did you know that concrete is the most commonly used human-made material on Earth? Producing cement, its main ingredient, causes around 8% of the world's total CO2 emissions. So, some intergovernmental agencies say the cement industry has to reduce its annual emissions by at least 16% by 2030. Waste is another big problem. Construction and demolition waste can represent up to 40% of solid waste produced in some cities. It's made of materials from excavation, roadwork and demolition, but also complex waste like plastics, metal, ceramic and cardboard. Construction has also caused some significant water and soil pollution incidents when debris, dirt, oil, paints and other harmful chemicals leaked into the environment. But a lot of construction materials can be recycled and reused. Some experts say that for any of this to happen, construction companies must be encouraged to separate waste on site and train their staff better. Of course, once constructed, ensuring that buildings are energy efficient is crucial. Energy demand in buildings has increased by 7% in just eight years. So the 2019 Emissions Gap Report says we must reverse the trend by improving energy efficiency in buildings at a rate of 2 to 3% each year by 2025. There are things we can do. 
from using sustainable materials, better waste management, and using energy from renewable sources, the buildings of tomorrow could be very different from those today. Green roofs, urban agriculture and rainwater containment are all nature-based solutions that many world cities are turning to to help them be more resilient and livable. But is there more that can be done? Let's find out from our expert, Christina Gamboa, an advocate for energy-saving buildings and cities. James has more. Welcome to London's South Bank. You can see behind me the Palace of Westminster. It's currently undergoing a massive renovation project that's hopefully going to make it a little more energy efficient and generally bring it up to scratch. It's a project that could take in excess of a decade. Christina Gambo, welcome to Sustainable Energy, and particularly whilst we're filming in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously we're taking the relevant precautions. So Christina, question, should we retrofit and renovate or should we just knock it all down and start from scratch? Definitely retrofit is the way forward. There has to be a sensibility and a consciousness of the limited resources we have in the world and uh, getting into historic buildings or, let's say, improving the quality of life goes through being innovative. Now, I read that a quarter of homes and 37% of non-residential buildings are in the least efficient categories, E, F and G, so they're wasting a lot of energy. Is that a particular situation in London? How are other world cities doing? Unfortunately, government puts out policies, doesn't enforce them, and generally there's lack of skills and education to understand what those ratings mean. If the audience would understand that, for example, an E, an e is pretty bad, is like being really irresponsible towards the resources of the planet, we would maybe have them act and, and go about how can we better improve let's say that their houses are, don't leak energy and that they are more comfortable and uh, do good for the planet. The UN is encouraging governments to reduce energy consumption in buildings, but we know that construction sector has developed a few bad habits over the years. So how do you rectify that, particularly when populations continue to grow? The building sector can be part, a central part of the solution. And if the building and construction sector doesn't act now and half at least of its emissions, we're not going to be on track. That's one. So addressing the solutions, bringing them to scale. And second, having business working with city leaders so they can enact better policies that will ensure that their own building stock, their government procurement codes will improve, that energy efficiency policies are enforced, and that we can also have this ambition loop of better signals from policy that this is coming, and then business reacting and also delivering, let's say, an infrastructure in a built environment that is better for people and planet. So do it now because it gets locked in for so long. Yes, because the decision, for example, that you're doing in your designs today is going to be effectively with us for years to come. Let's talk about some positive examples. Which are the world cities that are leading the way? We do have examples from 26 cities that have signed the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Declaration or commitment. And we are talking about, for example, leadership from Tokyo, Sydney, New York, London, and cities even in South Africa that are enacting net zero carbon buildings policies, but also putting out incentives for uh, industry to transform faster. Now we've seen that the use of cement is energy intensive in the construction industry, but can we build large scale without it or any other non-environmentally friendly material? So I think the answer is no, we cannot build without it, right? There has to be solutions that go address climate, people and different geographies around the world. Christina, thank you. And we'll hear more from our expert later on in the program. Thanks, James. And now a quick break. When we return, we are off to Bali to look at nature-based alternatives to cement. This house, the day that it was completed, it was made out of material none of which existed five or six years before. 